Generations of mathematicians have tried to prove the so-called bunk bed conjecture, a, a conjecture that seemed just obviously true. Yet nobody was ever quite able to prove it. And it turns out for very good reason, because the conjecture has just been disproven in a new paper to be false. And the story of how the authors discovered this counterexample, the interplay between computers and humans and mathematics, is a really interesting one, and I'm just excited to share the story with you today. So well, let's begin by just understanding what this conjecture is, and it's a conjecture in graph theory. A graph consists of a bunch of vertices and a bunch of edges that connect the vertices. You can imagine perhaps people on a social network, and then the connection is whether or not you're friends. Now one thing you can study is what happens if some of these connections start to fade away over time? For example, I can imagine that probabilistically some of the edges are going to decay in something called Bernoulli bond percolations, the fancy term for it. Basically the idea is you take some probability, I'll use a probability of half throughout this video, and then you imagine that for each of these edges with probability p it's going to decay. And you can imagine that this might be like, say, friendships that decay over time, the connection gets lost. So now we can ask well, all sorts of questions about this setup. So let's start with a simple graph to illustrate the point. I'm going to label two of the points to be u and v, and I'm going to imagine, can I travel from u to v? And as we can see here, there's multiple different ways that I can get from u and get over to v. But what would happen if I allow those connections to start fading? Like for instance, if these two edges fade, now there's no way that I can get from u to v. And with this graph only having four edges, that means there's two to the four or 16 possible graphs that could have come up after you do this decaying. And it turns out that in precisely five of them, is there a connection from the one side to the other, from the u to the v. And so I can speak probabilistically about this. I could say that there is a 5 16th chance, 5 of the 16 options, such that there is still a path from u to v after you do this bond percolation, this fading away of these edges. But we're not yet at the bunk bed conjecture. What I want to imagine if I have my graph is that actually I have two copies of the graph. I kind of want to imagine that one of the copies of the graph lives above the other one, kind of like two different bunk beds. Any good bunk bed needs to have some posts to collapse it. So you can imagine I have this top graph, this bottom graph, and these bunk bed posts which are connecting them. Now I have a bunk bed graph. And just the same way I had labeled the vertices like u and v along the bottom bunk, I'll use primes like u prime and v prime to label the same vertices, the corresponding vertices that are up in the top bunk. Now for my white posts that I have, it turns out that you actually don't need all of those. Uh, I'm going to use just to illustrate it one post, <laughs> maybe if there's a real bunk bed it would collapse. But to be a bunk bed graph you can have any num- you just need some posts that are connecting and surviving, it doesn't need to be all of them. So I'll illustrate this in the extreme example with only one post between the top and bottom bunk. So now let's do what we did before. Let's do that bond percolation where some of these edges are going to fade away, and maybe you get something like this. Now, and what I've got here, there's a connection between u and v, right? I can start at u and I can go along my graph and I can get to the point v. But I can't get from u to v prime. There, there's no way in this graph that I can start at u and get to v prime. Too many edges in the top bunk have failed. If I did this maybe a different way, maybe it was some other sets of edges that faded away, now I can't get from u to v, but I can get from u to v prime. So if I start at u, sometimes I can get to v, sometimes I can get to v prime. And so now I can finally state what the bunk bed conjecture is precisely. It says that the probability that I can get from u to v, that is the probability that I can move along the base, is bigger or equal to the probability that I can start in the base and then get to the v prime, be going up to the top bunk in my bunk bed. And the conjecture says that this is true for all connected graphs and all subset of bench posts and all pairs u and v. And intuitively here, it seems like this should be true. If I had all of the posts in my bunk bed, so for every pair of vertices the posts were there, then the probabilities would be equal. Like if I could get from u to v, I would just go up the post to get to v prime. However, because there's only some of the posts available, in this extreme example I've only put one of my posts here, 
The only way I can get from u to v prime is the specific paths that go through that particular post that I have. It just feels like there should be less of them, so the probability should be smaller. I can actually compute it out in this particular example. A probability from u to v, and we've already computed that, going down to the base, that's just the 5 16th, we did that already. For the probability that I get from u to v prime, I have to go through the post on my bunk bed. And so that means perhaps I, I will relabel it, like I'll call it a w and a w prime for either said side of, of this post that I have here. It means that I have to first get over to the w, so I have to take the probability that I can get from u to w, and then I go up the post, get to w prime, and I have to ask, can I get from w prime to v prime? So the probability has these two stages. I get to the post, and then I go from the post all the way to the v prime. Okay, so the first of these is just 5 16ths again. The, the v and the w, it's completely symmetric. This first part is 5 16 And then if I'm sitting there at w prime, well, I can either go directly over to v prime, in one step, or it can take me two steps and I go the long way around, or maybe I do a whole bunch of loops, but I've, I got these two different options. With three edges, there's two to the power of three is eight possibilities, and five of them, there's a way to get to V prime. So this is gonna be five eighths. And so this example satisfies the conjecture. The probability along the bottom bunk is five sixteenths, and the probability of getting up to the top bunk is smaller than five sixteenths. So the conjecture appears to be true in this particular example. And, and so it sort of feels intuitively, you know, quote unquote obvious that this will always be the case. If you have enough posts, then maybe the probabilities will be equal. But if you cut down on the number of posts, you're more restricted on the pathways to get to the top, right? So the, the probability on the top should always be smaller or equal. And so ultimately this bunk bed conjecture really feels like it ought to be true, but it's just evaded proof since 1985 where it sort of started its origins until the present when a brand new paper, well, a preprint of a paper has just been posted on the Mathematics Archive. This paper is by Gladkov, Pack, and Zimin, and they have come up with a counter example to this particular conjecture. And it's a huge graph. There is 7,222 different vertices in it. So far, far, far larger than my little animation that I'm putting up here. But nevertheless, it turns out to be, by the tiniest margin, a counterexample to this claim. Now, one of the things that I really appreciated about the authors is that they took the time in their paper to articulate their failed attempts leading up to their proof. And I think the story of these failed attempts is really interesting and instructive, and so I always appreciate when authors put those into the paper as they did. By the way, I'm gonna link their papers and some blog posts that they've written down in the description below. Check out all the full details there. So the first thing that the authors did was they said, well, let's try to use the computer just to exhaustively search through all of the small graphs. But there's so many possibilities of graphs, even with small numbers of vertices, that when they were doing this exhaustive search and then checking the probabilities for each graph, you're only able to do it up to at most eight vertices and at most 15 edges until they gave up on this exhaustive search. The next approach that they took was to adapt a machine learning algorithm that actually had been created in previous papers by Wagner. And here there is a neural network that is trying to learn and find these graphs where the probabilities are going to be really, really close together and, and hopefully find one where the probability going to the top bunk is lower than the probability going along the bottom bunk. This machine learning algorithm had been successfully used to disprove actually a number of prior conjectures in graph theory, and maybe it would apply here. And it was helpful using the machine learning approach as opposed to an exhaustive approach because you got larger graphs. Like they were able to look at, for example, n equal to 30 in terms of the number of vertices. But even here, the differences between the probabilities was so small that it was within the uncertainty of these probabilistic Monte Carlo simulations that they're doing to estimate what the probability actually is. And as a result, it wasn't going to be fruitful at being able to figure out what the counterexample is. And now that we've seen a counterexample, how many insanely large number of vertices it has, and so with the benefit of hindsight, this computer approach was unlikely to be fruitful given the size of the counterexample that was finally discovered. And what's interesting is that this counterexample was discovered now not by the computer. 
It was discovered, quote unquote, by hand. Okay, so to understand that, we actually have to jump now to a different mathematician who was working at the same time. This is a mathematician by the name of Hollum, and in 2024, he released a paper that was trying to look at generalizations of the bunk bed conjecture. And basically the idea is we have the, the normal bunk bed conjecture, but what if we generalize it to larger settings? Can we disprove its generalizations? And indeed, we can. So let me describe this slightly more general setting. Here I have three vertices. And instead of a graph, I'm going to introduce the idea of a hypergraph. And what a hypergraph does is instead of having an edge connecting two vertices, maybe I'll have, for example, a triangle which connects three vertices. So the hyper edge of length three is the fancy way of describing this triangle, but it's just an object that's connecting three different vertices. So this is a hypergraph. It has 10 different vertices on it, and it has six different hyper edges of length three connecting different subsets of the vertices. And it turns out that this hypergraph can be used to disprove a generalization of the bunk bed conjecture. So it's the bunk bed conjecture, but for hypergraphs, and with also a small stipulation, it's called the alternative bunk bed conjecture. Basically the idea is that the top bunk and the bottom bunk, it has to be that precisely one of any given edge or hyper edge has to fade away while the other one is retained. And with posts for the bunk beds at the three green vertices, this was a counterexample. So we've now got this attempt to generalize the original bunk bed conjecture, and the attempt to generalize it is false, and there's this lovely object, this lovely hypergraph. So now we turn back to our authors, and they're looking at this paper and trying to figure out, well, can we use this object to somehow disprove things in our setting? Now, they can't use a hypergraph, the bunk bed conjecture is what it graphs. They gotta take this hypergraph and tweak it so that it becomes just a normal graph with normal edges connecting two vertices as normal. So they color coded in this way with some of the edges being blue and red. And they inserted the following object a whole bunch of times. So this graph kind of looks like spokes along a wheel or a portion of a wheel. And it turns out that what they needed to do to get the probabilities to flip was to add 1,204 of these spokes, an enormous number of spokes. And, and basically what they did is everywhere in the original graph for Hollum where there's one of these hyper edges, these triangles, is they take that object at the bottom and they stick it in right there going in to replace that triangle. So each hyper edge is now replaced with a whole bunch of vertices, a whole bunch of edges, it becomes a graph, but it's enormous because every one of these six hyper edges gets replaced with well, something here with 1204 different vertices. So if you add up the computation, the total number of vertices are the, the 10 that you begin with, plus six times this, well, 1202 are the, the new ones that get added every time. This leaves 7,222. And there's some technical details here, which I'll leave to the paper I've linked down below if you're interested in reading the details. But this is a counterexample. And by the tiniest of margins, like in the estimates of the probability, which they have to use the computers for, the computers haven't gone away entirely, the, the probabilities of going to the top bunk as opposed to the bottom bunk is, is less than 10 to the negative like 4,000 and something. It's a tiny, 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 tiny difference in the probabilities, but it's enough and we have a counterexample. Uh, quick cautionary note, this paper has not yet gone through peer review. I'm doing sort of an, an oddly early breaking news math video here. So just leave that as a cautionary note and uh, we'll, we'll just see what happens going into the future. Now, when I was reading through the work of one of the authors, Igor Pak, I saw an old blog post of his from 2020 entitled, What If They're All Wrong? And in this blog post, which I'll, I'll link down below, he really makes the case for going after conjectures like this conjecture that are just widely thought to be true. And he really takes this lovely attitude of questioning to these conjectures and sort of lays out the virtues and indeed sometimes even the beauty of trying to go after finding conjectures like this one that you would get to construct for these conjectures that are widely thought to be true. This is far from the first conjecture that he's disproven, and something tells me it's not going to be the last. All right, so I want to thank everybody for watching. If you're a fan of algorithms, well, why don't you give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm? And with that said and done, we'll do some more math 
in the next video.